Thank you for having me, uh, firstly, in this very interesting debate on how we can retain and attract women in, uh, in ICT skills. So thanks for the opportunity. Um, I will maybe first um, present myself. I'm not a CEO, just to be correct. I'm corporate VP managing uh, Benelux and, and helping to get a French organization transformed to an international organization, which obviously includes uh, a major point on uh, diversity inclusion in all, uh, in all aspects. I've got a fabulous uh, panel. I will uh, just present them with the name, but they will have the chance to comment uh, later on. We've got uh, Vesel Kofsky, uh, policy officer from the European uh, Commission. Uh, Vesela, if you would be so kind to put your camera on, then also the people online can, can see your face. We have Jeff Anin, CEO for AXA Insurance uh, in uh, Belgium. Thank you, Jeff, for joining. We have Christine Regitz, vice president for SAP. Uh, Christina, I do not see you yet, I think, but uh, you will put your camera on later also. We've got uh, Valeria uh, de Flavais, uh, Head of Innovative Models in Novartis, but she will be present by uh, video. We have uh, Eva Fabri, Managing Director, European Center of Women in Technology. Uh, welcome, Hi. Eva. And we have uh, Sevil Gayas, Head of Talent and Strategy and Development Management for Vodafone in Turkey. Just allow me to make one comment that I received by social media uh, before the, the session from uh, Donna Hertzman. I don't know if Donna is on the line, that our panel was not diverse enough and that we didn't um, had enough women of color. Um, Donna, I take your comment uh, at heart, um, but apologize. Uh, we will certainly get that into the next panels in, in, in uh, CEPIS. And we will certainly also ask a question around that to the different panelists. Um, if you would have, uh, have questions online, I will try to do two things at the same time. Uh, moderate and follow the chat. So do not hes hesitate to ask uh, questions in the chat and then I can present them to the different uh, panelists also. If you put your name and your origin, then it is easier to refer to you in answering them. So Vesela, let's start with uh, you as a policy officer of the European Commission. Can you just elaborate a little bit what uh, the European Commission is doing in the field of retention and attr attraction of women in ICT rules? Yes. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, we are not doing DG Connect uh, in particular um, is uh, where uh, women uh, women in ICT um, is uh, kind of tackled. Um, it's not a policy DG where women in ICT can actually be uh, tackled in a meaningful way. Uh, we can only talk about it and we can raise awareness of the problem. Uh, in actual fact, um, it is uh, now um, part, an issue which is part of uh, the Commission's gender equality strategy, which was adopted this, uh, uh, this March. Uh, and uh, that uh, basically increases its uh, political weight uh, and its uh, leverage. Uh, because uh, uh, as long as uh, an issue does not enter the uh, policy development uh, and uh, policy making uh, pipeline, uh, it will simply sit in the communication uh, domain. Um, what uh, uh, what have we done? Uh, what have we actually uh, done? Uh, it all started in 2016 with some uh, goodwill um, actions to uh, uh, raise awareness of the issue on the basis of a study that we did called "Women in the Digital Age." Uh, the study highlighted uh, pretty much all the uh, problems that were uh, outlined by uh, by the previous uh, uh, speakers. And um, on that basis, uh, we went through uh, uh, an internal uh, action plan with a lot of uh, with a lot of enthusiasm, also from the Commission at the time. Um, and uh, finally, this uh, culminated in a in the signing of a ministerial declaration uh, by the member states on uh, women in digital, where they commit to uh, six actions. 
Um, only three of these actions are uh, concrete and actionable. Uh, the others uh, are uh, more like uh, we encourage the member states to involve, to have a balanced composition on boards of companies dealing with digital or on public, uh, public organisms dealing with digital. Um, uh, the actionable points uh, are the uh, asking, we ask the member states to uh, develop each one of them um, specific target based uh, action plan or strategy on how to um, involve, how to engage and how to increase the numbers of women studying STEM uh, and also how to um, uh, integrate them in, into the digital uh, economy. Uh, this is the first action. Uh, the second action is uh, to uh, inaugurate, to establish one single day. Uh, we indicated the last uh, Thursday of every April, uh, which would be dedicated as the European Day for Women uh, in Digital across the EU. It is now celebrated in a kind of patchy way. Some, some countries uh, mark it, others don't. Um, and we would like this to happen as of next year for the uh, whole of the, uh, of the EU. Uh, and the third action is to improve our monitoring and our, uh, our measuring, uh, the, the way we monitor and the way we, we measure the, uh, the problem in order to have a better idea and a more informed um, uh, idea of what is, what is happening in every member state. Uh, we set up for the purpose the so-called women in uh, the uh, the women in digital scoreboard, uh, which uh, is now an integral part of the um, digital economic and uh, social index. Uh, I I don't know if my if the audience is, uh, knows about it. It it is an annual reporting uh, reporting which um, which we do for all the member states on um, on uh, digital uh, however it is not um, uh, possibly detailed enough and uh, it, it requires fine-tuning uh, how are we implementing these things um, we have uh, I, I personally work with a, a group of national representatives who um, uh, has met uh, twice uh, until uh, until now, uh, and uh, we we are trying to uh, to push uh, governments to the extent possible uh, to act on the issue. Um, I have to say that uh, we have been sidetracked, or these um, these experts, these uh, national representatives, have been sidetracked because of the COVID uh, uh, COVID crisis. So the issue was deprioritized. Uh, for uh, for obvious reasons, but uh, we believe that uh, it will it will rise back to the uh, to the top of the agenda. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Vesela. And maybe it's um, a good thing to put reference to the six point actions in the in the chat that people can uh, can refer to and check also with their local governments sure. what they are doing. You were referring also to DG Connect. Uh, Celia also mentioned. It. Um, I'm also part of the European Board for Digital Skills and Jobs Coalition, and I can only confirm that uh, this theme is uh, is a major priority of that of that board. Uh, Jeff Anin, Jeff, your uh, your uh, mail, as everybody can see. Um, thanks for that. But I think uh, diversity in all aspects is important, and we need all men to help us. So, how do you, as an executive, um, organize? Uh, and mobilize and change the culture in, in your organization in order to uh, go to an inclusive uh, culture? Well, uh, first of all, uh, thank you, Saskia, for inviting me here. Uh, um, well, uh, it's uh, it, because it's a topic which I hold very close at heart. Huh? So um, what we do as AXA, uh, so we currently have a management committee in Belgium, which is 50-50 uh, male and female. Um, and it's all due to internal promotion. So we didn't go on the lookout to search for that specific uh, female on the outside. Uh, and, we, and of course, that's, uh, that's hard work, hard work, because uh, it means that you need to focus on female talent in your organization in, at all levels. Uh, and, you, and to do that, we, we have a diversity manager uh, who's not only focusing, of course, on, 
on gender, but also on sexual orientation, on ethnicity, and a whole lot of other uh, areas of diversity and inclusion. Uh, and so, in the end, we're very proud that we have uh, uh, that we're actually the only big financial institution in Belgium with a 50-50 management committee. The levels below are roughly, uh, we're not there yet, uh, to be very honest, we're at 35% at the two levels below female participation, 65. So there's still a little bit of work to do, and but we have a firm ambition to be there by 2023. So it's not some far distant future. Um, if I can conclude, uh, I think we're the, the only uh, 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 big financial institution in Belgium uh, where uh, there is a, a, a diverse management committee. Uh, yeah. Thanks for that, Jeff. And, and just an additional question, one which I just also saw this morning. Um, I, I know that you are doing a lot of um, networking events, uh, which was one of the issues which was mentioned. Um, what is the vision of, of AXA? Uh, should we also invite men or should we limit it to do women? Uh, well, no, I think definitely you should invite men eh? because, I mean, um, uh, the way society currently is today, I think in some countries less and less, eh? but we are all in this together. Eh? And I think uh, if I can tell you a big secret, Saskio, uh, I, I like it a lot more to be, uh, let's say, CEO, to be a member of a diverse team eh? than to be with 12 men around the table because... Uh, uh, it is only when you are 50-50, more or less, that as a man also, you can play the, the typ typical male cards where maybe you have an, uh, an edge, just as women can do that. So we are equal but diverse. And that's the whole point of, uh, of, of this diversity. And so, yes, please do so. Invite uh, men also to participate in those networking events. This is sometimes a statement that I have to uh, do in women events. We need the men to help us. We can't do it alone. So um, uh, thanks for that uh, vision. Um, I will come back to some, some other questions later. Uh, Christine. Um, Christine is um, uh, working at this AP. Um, and in the preparation, Christine, you told me some surprising and pretty disruptive actions that SAP is taking to, to tackle this uh, subject. So maybe you can share those experiences a little bit with the audience. Yes, so, and thanks, uh, first of all, for inviting me. And, uh, you know, um, SAP uh, is a, a, pr a pretty, uh, so to say, young company compared to other companies. And uh, in the IT space, there's a lot uh, to be done. And especially in Germany, we have a very, um, a, a very engaged um, head of HR, and he is totally convinced. And I think this is the first, the first and utmost important thing that uh, you know, the top of the company is behind uh, diversity, uh, gender diversity and others. So um, what we have established is, for instance, and this is valid for Germany because you know, it's some legal aspects always in, in, legal, in, in contracting. What we do in Germany is uh, we say that uh, part-time leadership is not an option, but a standard. Um, so when we post now in Germany a position, um, it is this standard that it's that it's posted as an 80% part-time job. So it's not the standard 100%, but 80% is the standard. So we say standard is part-time and, and any leadership position can be filled also in part-time. Secondly, what we do is, and we are very, um, very happy that this works out very well for female and male colleagues is uh, job sharing. So, and we have this not only on an expert level, but we all have it also as co-leadership. So two persons share a job or a management position. And uh, surprisingly, also a lot of male colleagues are heavily engaged in these co-leadership um, things, what we are having. And then in order to also you know diversity is also uh, having diverse perspectives. Uh, at SAP, it's, it's totally uh, standard that you can go to a fellowship. So go for half a year into a different department and make a different job to enrich your own job, to get new experience. And what you also have, what you can do is a social sabbatical. So you can, for a certain period of time, um, support an NGO. Uh, and, you know, there are also it's a big variety of NGOs what we support. And also here, SAP is helping. And just... In COVID times, uh, what also SAP did is 
uh, it allowed uh, new fathers um, to stay on a paid basis uh, a couple of weeks home uh, without working so that also they can have uh, you know enjoying their um, the, the newborn kid. By the way, we also have a network which is called Fathers at SAP. So that's just examples what we're doing and uh, I think we're pretty successful in Germany. At least we are in a row also um, nominated as employer of choice for women. Uh, although we cannot neglect, still there's way to go. Christina, then allow me to ask um, um, a direct question. Yeah. Uh, having run around in a lot of international uh, IT organizations, um, how, how can you then convince the middle layer of the organization? So like you're saying, it's important to have at least a buy-in of the top. Yeah. But the people who are having the roles of people managers, which is sometimes a hurdle which we've seen on reasons not to promote women, mm -hmm. um, they're still there. So how do you help those people to, to, to change their mind, to change their culture, to change their way of seeing things? Um, first of all, I, I think it's, it's really important that the top management is behind because without that, there's no other there's no no need for the, no yeah you know no no have no possibility to change so that's the first and utmost important thing and this is then also giving you know this is a role modeling then also for the whole organization and then you know we have also as we're working in teams a lot there's also some kind of i call it social pressure so it is not you know it is not popular anymore um having non-diverse teams so you know it's just what you have to do is to kind of uh, create this culture of uh, there's no question about that. And, uh, you know, it's no questions that you can do a management position in 80, even in 70 percent part time. And, you know, everybody it's uh, kind of who says uh, that uh, you, you have to have 100 percent job. Uh, it's just uh, that's not accepted anymore. And so you, you have to do it both, you know, from the top. But you have also from the bottom saying, um, we have a self-confidence that we can do it, we can run it. And then, you know, the, the, the people who are doubting have no choice, but, well, they can leave the company, but uh, then they have, yeah. they have no choice because this is a common standard in SAP. So this is common sense in SAP. So what I hear you saying is that you first need to visualize the early champions, uh, the, yeah. the ones who have an early buy-in, and then the social control will motivate uh, most of uh, most of the others um, yeah, help, yeah. Uh, going forward help yeah. with networks with initiatives you know to make it visible and then you in these days you have a lot of supporters okay i will certainly come back to you i propose we now take uh, erica help me with the logistics i think i propose we take now the video of valeria de flavis uh, head of innovative models at uh, novartis Hi, my name is Valeria De Flavis and uh, I'm a management engineer. Currently, I'm the head of innovative models in Novartis Italy, the, the pharmaceutical company, and I'm the responsible for uh, digital transformation and open innovation, managing all the digital and technical projects. I joined Novartis two years ago. Uh, before this experience, I spent uh, two years uh, in a media company here in Italy as a digital lead and uh, before that I spent uh, 12 years in the consultancy world uh, working in IT and digital projects. I was always passionate about technology even though it's an environment dominated by men. Uh, most of women find technology cold and aseptic but to work in a tech world I believe that is necessary a lot of creativity more than expected, that's for sure. When I joined Novartis, one of my main goals was to create and build up my team because the function was completely new. Now, after two years, uh, I have two people in my team, a guy uh, and a girl and a woman. Uh, Novartis, uh, thanks to his inclusive approach, puts you as a manager in the position to offer equal opportunities to any associates and uh, consequently to bring and retain the best talents, no matter gender or background. And this is a very important thing for us. 
Novartis is putting in play currently uh, many actions to create a diverse, equitable and inclusive environment. But uh, talking about attracting and retain women in tech position, I would like to mention two relevant uh, initiatives uh, that uh, are currently led by Novartis. The first initiative is the Data Science Development for Women program. Um, it's a six weeks training and mentoring program for women interested in building foundational data science skills. The program seeks uh, uh, to contribute uh, uh, to a rebalancing of women in data science roles uh, through a combination of skills development and career mentoring. But the uh, second and most important activity is the commitment to, to achieve uh, gender balance and management uh, by 2023 and ensuring pay equity and transparency globally. Novartis signed it uh, with a public pledge with uh, the Equal Pay International Coalition. Uh, but these are only two of several best practices Novartis is putting in place. In fact, Novartis uh, works every day to support all the associates uh, as much as he can. About this, I would like to mention what Novartis have done during the COVID-19 pandemic. Supporting us through, for instance, continuous remote working or psychological and medical support. In addition to this, Novartis is launching their Choice with Responsibility initiative, giving to any employee the possibility to decide how, where and when to work to create the greatest impacts for its role. Well, I believe that all these actions are making Novartis the best place to work for men and women for any kind of job position. Thanks. So, thank you. Um, then for the next, Eva. Eva, you are uh, representing the Women in Technology, um, working on a lot of uh, larger scale European projects, uh, which uh, gives a great opportunity also to um, create a test bit a little bit uh, uh, around, uh, around the subject. Uh, maybe you can give us a little bit insight on, on what the European Centre for Women and Technology uh, did during the last, uh, the last periods and maybe also your, your challenges uh, going forward. Um, thank you, Saskia. Um, yes, uh, the, the large scale project we are um, primarily involved in now is uh, Women for IT, uh, innovative solutions to increase the number of uh, young women uh, to the digital agenda. And it is a three year project running from 2018 21 uh, and uh, funded by the uh, youth program Norway grant uh, Cecilia Bundefeld Digital Europe mentioned and we and uh, the project is led by the Latvian uh, Information and uh, Communication Technology Association LICTA and with partners from uh, eight Uh, for the uh, increase the employability of young women in the NEET group. And I think this NEET group is uh, really crucial also uh, for CPs in uh, larger simply because it involves young people uh, between 19 and 29 years of age. Uh, young people or education, not in employment and not in training. Frankly speaking, especially after COVID, this is a rapidly growing group. And uh, in 29, and between um, uh, 16 to 30% uh, of uh, the young people all around Europe were uh, involved in this need group. The difference between the different European countries varies a lot. So uh, the uh, country where uh, the need target group has the big proportion uh, from our project participant countries, the biggest um, proportion is of the women and 19.8% uh, um, 
8% of the men belong to this target group. And in Belgium, for example, the uh, ratio of um, the need group is 17.3% uh, for women, 12.9% uh, 12 for men. So uh, this is a really a crucial target group in regard to uh, ICT. Uh, uh, Eva, could you just maybe put off your camera because we have a small bandwidth uh, problem, I think, to hear you. Okay, uh, maybe. unfortunately we have unstable internet uh, the whole time uh, during COVID, so uh, this is not an issue. Um, yes, but this uh, is better, I... this is better, go ahead. Okay, so uh, I would like to um, uh, add to this that uh, we have just uh, finished the second year uh, of the project, uh, which means that uh, the what we have uh, produced in the first two years is uh, a massive uh, uh, research study uh, in regard to um, good examples of um, working with the lead target group in uh, all around Europe. And uh, the second study uh, presents uh, the results uh, of uh, the needs assessment of uh, the business sector and uh, the target group, the women, uh, who would like to uh, get uh, involved in um, the ITT sector. The study identifies also uh, the future trends and uh, in the end of the day we have identified eight um, job profiles uh, crucial uh, for the uh, future uh, digital sector. The, these are uh, data protection specialists, data analysts, digital media specialists, software tester, graphic designer, junior web developer, project coordinator, and customer service representative. In the second um, year of the project, we just uh, ended now in September, uh, we have developed the profiling platform, the training roadmaps, and the employment toolkit. And formally, the uh, pilot of the project uh, started in the end of September and beginning of October and uh, will be um, ended by um, June uh, 2021. Uh, so this is just a brief summary of uh, what the project looked like yesterday. Okay, thank you Eva. I will certainly come back to you, um, but it goes a little bit better without, uh, without uh, the, the video. Thank you for that. So let's go to uh, Sevil, Sevil Kayas from Turkey. Um, she is um, talent and strategy development manager at Vodafone in, in Turkey. Um, now, uh, there, are, there are obviously different questions which I could ask you, but the first is to give us a little bit on, on, on the challenges uh, you have as an organization to attract and to retain um, uh, female, female talents and, and how do you mitigate them? Hi Saskia, thank you uh, for this. I think it's really very good to be here. So I think, you know, there are lots of challenges that we are having, especially for the IT roles. So uh, we may discuss about, I mean, lots of things, but I would like to mention some of them here. So first one is, you know, the talent scarcity within the market. So for example, as an HR person, I'm working in HR area for more than 20 years. And when you want to recruit someone from external market, it's not very easy in Turkey. I guess it is similar to the other countries as well. So the talent scarcity is first thing that I can mention. In Vodafone, we are taking some actions, you know, to overcome this challenge. Uh, first one is, you know, we are always doing proactively mapping, especially for the IT roles. So we are not, you know, waiting for the role to be open, but before that, we are really putting great effort. And also we are focusing on the young talent recruitment because young, young talent is really very good for the organization. We have some specific programs like Discover Young Talent Program, Long Term Intuition Program, where we recruit some young talent uh, IT uh, people from the external market. Uh, and then we support them with a really structured and very good development program. And they become, you know, the expertise and future leaders within the organization. I can say this one. Uh, and most of the young talents are being recruited in our company to the technology function, especially for the IT roles uh, because of the talent scarcity. Uh, and we are always keeping, you know, the female ratio there. 
this year, for example, it is 60%, which is really very stretching target for us. So we are always increasing the you know, percentage of the female ratio while doing the recruitment. So the second, I mean, challenge can be, you know, the high uh, ratio of male in IT roles because it, you know, directly impacts the environment. So we believe that as Vodafone, we want, we need to create an inclusive environment within technology function. Uh, and for this purpose, you know, we are always having some stretching KPIs targets for leaders like the other companies. And currently we have, you know, uh, 43 uh, 42 percentage uh, female uh, representation company-wide in the company. And it is, you know, more than 40 percentage in the leadership roles. So this is, I think, what we are trying to do. Always, you know, we are trying to put some targets because if we put a target as a company, we always achieve it, you know, it really keeps the focus here. Uh, and of course, you know, we are taking some initiatives from the cultural perspectives as well. So we are doing some, you know, trainings, programs uh, regarding the diversity and inclusion part, especially for the leaders to create an inclusive environment everywhere, not only in the technology function, but also everywhere. So the third thing that I want to mention is, you know, the soft skill development and the encouragement, because, you know, I think improving the expertise is a really easy part. But on the other hand, while doing this, I think in I mean, improving the soft skills are not very easy when I compare with this expertise improvement. So it is not only, you know, relevant for the female leaders or female uh, females in IT. It's also the same for the men. But to be honest, I should say that, you know, when there is an opportunity, a vacancy in a uh, function, uh, men are really more passionate about it because the woman thinks that they should have required experiences, exactly the required experiences to apply for the job. So when you look at the, you know, moves, uh, women are moving uh, horizontally where people, I mean, where men are really moving vertically. So I think from this approach, there are some differences between men and women. So I think what we are doing in Vodafone is, you know, we always support women with some structured soft skills development programs like women empowerment or mentorship programs within Vodafone, because otherwise, you know, they need to be encouraged, I mean, by the others, especially to move vertically within the organization. So I think this is the third one. And maybe the last one can be some of the speakers also mentioned during their speech. I think the managing work-life balance. So we definitely know that, you know, the women's careers are changing after uh, they get married, they have some children. So I think managing all these things are really not very easy for women. Uh, maybe it can be similar for men, but we know that, you know, women are really having more struggles there. So uh, we are having some maternity policy. We introduced it in 2015. And now the good news is one year ago, we enhanced this policy. It was maternity, you know, leave before. Now it is paternal leave uh, for everyone, you know, having a children, uh, they can use this leave. And it directly, I believe that impacts women career uh, within business life, not only in Vodafone, but in the other companies as well. Because when you give this leave to uh, men, it also helps, you know, uh, the woman uh, to move their career. Uh, and also the other thing is the flexibility. You know, we always try to provide flexibility within Vodafone, especially for the last eight months, we are working from home uh, because of the COVID situation in Turkey. And I think it will be the same until the COVID situation, you know, uh, becomes to the normal situation. But I think it will be the same after becoming normal as well, because as a company, we are also working on the new normal where we provide some more flexibility to the woman especially from, you know, uh, cultural perspective on the hours, locations, you know, uh, they can plan their time, they can uh, work whenever they want. So I think this will also bring lots of flexibility to the women's life where we can keep, I mean, more, more women, where we can, you know, develop them. So these are the things that I would like to mention uh, here, Saskia. Thank you, Seval. And I have an additional um, uh, question that pops up in my mind. I had yesterday evening a session which is called the seat at the table. So there is an operational manager who has the chance to uh, discuss a little bit with vulnerable youngsters. It were most female yesterday evening. And one of their question or one of their frustration was, how did we, do we need to change our CV? Because now we have the impression that it's not even read. 
So what would you answer to that question? How, what, what do we need to change in our CV to be sure that it's read to a value? Mm, or maybe okay. I need to give you some time to reflect on the question because it wasn't prepared, but. So maybe, back, maybe I can mention this in the, in the other question, especially when we are talking about the skills, Saskia, because it is directly related to yep. skills as well. Huh? Okay, okay, no problem. I'll come Sorry. back to you then. Okay. Uh, Vasela. Uh, maybe to come back a little bit on, on um, uh, work-life balance. Um, I know that um, uh, you, you talked about creating awareness. Uh, we are now living a, a crisis. Uh, my personal opinion is that um, we will never go back to normal. Um, but, but the new way of working, the subject of, of, of work-life balance, uh, is that also part of your awareness uh, program and I'm not talking specifically for women I think it has been said um, uh, every every person will maybe review a little bit the balance between welfare and well-being so is that also part of your your scope and your awareness program I think you're still on mute if you're speaking can you hear me now yeah now I can hear you. Okay. Uh, 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 indirectly, yes. It's. Uh, uh, it's. I think that flexibility is, uh, and uh, given the fact that women are uh, are now uh, part of the uh, of the job market, even though they're still their numbers are still low in the um, in the ICT uh, sector. Um, uh, of course, work-life balance is uh, is uh, a key issue uh, for for them, for us, uh, for us women. Um, we 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 have we don't have any any particular concrete uh, concrete actions uh, uh, actions on that. Um, but I mean, I I, I would like to to share some uh, some thoughts um, about about this. Uh, and also about framing the problem of um, of uh, women in uh, in uh, companies and uh, and about companies. Even though I'm not a I'm not a company person, but I have worked in the private sector before my in my pre commission uh, commission life. Um, uh, so I think that reconciling work life balance is really primarily a personal choice. And um, no matter um, how, how, how much uh, company and organizational talk is going on about this, uh, it is really about uh, us women and also men, uh, they also need a work-life balance uh, unless they have very particular career ambitions. Um, we have to put the barriers to uh, to organizations and companies that invade personal time and personal space, uh, and actually the COVID uh, the COVID crisis has uh, illustrated this uh, uh, beautifully because uh, we have discovered uh, how disenchanting uh, teleworking is, uh, where the barriers between work and uh, our personal lives uh, are totally blurred. Uh, we are pretty much available uh, constantly uh, and we're expected to react uh, on the minute immediately. So uh, it is really first of all up to us to be able to say no um, and uh, and put the data and no, no matter how many, uh, I mean company and organizational seminars and uh, manifestos and uh, uh, goodwill uh, commitments, uh, management and CEOs uh, sign, uh, if that does not uh, turn into a rigid company policy, um, I don't think that work-life balance will be attainable unless the actual employees and us as individuals uh, react, react to it. Um, Another thing I wanted to uh, to flag about the uh, the framing then of uh, of the issue of women of women in ICT, um, you may be aware of uh, of a research uh, piece that came out from the University of Leeds and Missouri a couple of years ago, which I found fascinating. 
And uh, its, uh, uh, its conclusions are that um, women, uh, uh, that there is much uh, less women uh, in uh, STEM uh, careers, in STEM studies, but also in STEM, in, uh, STEM careers, uh, in gender equal countries, particularly in countries uh, uh, in Northern Europe uh, who have a, a fantastic track record in, uh, in uh, gender equality. Um, we really have to be uh, careful about, um, I have been really over the years exposed to a lot of free talk uh, about um, uh, women being discriminated against. I mean, we are talking about the EU. Women being discriminated against, that they are victims, uh, that they are oppressed by uh, stereotypes, etc. While that may be true, we do have we do have equality guaranteed in our legal system. It is a fundamental right, and uh, we should not be easily um, pointing the fingers to these ephemeral. Uh, um, uh, pseudo problems uh, when actually the problems, uh, in my opinion, lie elsewhere. Uh, one, we talk a lot about trainings, we talk a lot about, uh, for example, well, the first one that comes to mind is training in, in, uh, in unconscious bias. Are we trying to change people? We can't, we can't even change our own children. I think it's important to change the systems the systems, changing the systems in a way that create a level playing field for everybody and allowing women to be hired and to be promoted on merit. I personally am not a believer in quotas and I think there's plenty of research now that that proves that quotas are counterproductive in, uh, in many ways, although they do up the numbers in, uh, in companies. Um, so uh, the, uh, this is the first thing that I that, that I wanted to say. Um, the uh, uh, the research that I mentioned um, uh, explains this uh, gender equality paradox in uh, STEM studies and in STEM careers uh, uh, by saying that actually women in the developed world in uh, in Europe and especially in countries where they are highly emancipated, such as in countries in, uh, in uh, Northern Europe, women have the luxury and the privilege of choice. They choose what they like, they prefer, they, they manifest their, uh, their preferences uh, freely, and their preferences are not necessarily always framed by economic consideration. While in uh, countries, in lesser developed countries, where gender equality is not embedded in the uh, in the legal system, in the culture, and uh, and uh, uh, in those society, in those societies, women see undertaking a, st a STEM studies or a career in ICT uh, or a, jo a job in, uh, in ICT as a way to. Uh, get financial freedom and also as a way to escape possibly oppressive or even abusive uh, family uh, family um, uh, environments. So we, I think that we should be uh, uh, we should be wary uh, wary of how we uh, we frame the project the the problem, and uh, we should delve much dig much deeper because we do have in Europe prerequisites which are already there. So we can't just freely, you know, <laughs> I think it's a gross simplification just to say, you know, stereotypes. Uh, and we, we risk turning this uh, label diversity and inclusion into something, into like corporate talk that we tick off a box. And uh, while on the other side, people can just see it as, a, as tokenism. Thank you, Vasela. Very interesting uh, remarks. Uh, Jeff, I would like to go to you because I've heard that um, you want you have an objective of having 50-50 uh, by 2023. Um, then I hear Vasela 
setting quotas, I'm not sure uh, that it's necessarily. And um, I've got a question from uh, Jeff Nabur, um, and I'll just read, uh, read the full questions a little bit in three pieces. Do we believe that we have failed if only 25% of women eventually take up IT careers? Or do we believe we have failed if 75% of the women eventually, eventually take up IT careers? What does equality mean? Is 50-50 realistic? Well, th those are lots of questions. Uh, so let's me first say that I'm all for quotas, but let's not start that debate here uh, because I think we need to jumpstart this. Uh, so uh, um, and so what we have seen in government, for example, uh, I can cite the case of Belgium or, or many other governments uh, who have installed quotas uh, for elections, uh, where one third had to be at least on certain lists of the opposite sex. You see that in a very natural manner, then uh, the ball gets rolling. And I want to tie this in a little bit to your previous question, Saskia, where you said, what do we do that our CVs need to get accepted by a company? Well, I think often, sadly so, you need to start with topics like that where the power is. And the power is in, in uh, supervisory boards and at management committee level. And so, uh, to say it a little bit, maybe with a with a shocker or a boot out, I, maybe if that company doesn't accept your CV because it's biased either toward gender or ethnicity or uh, sexual preference or any other topic or, or uh, ability, then maybe, uh, 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 well, then you shouldn't go and work for that company huh? uh, as, a, as, a, as, uh, as somebody who, who belongs to that uh, let's say, uh, area of uh, diversity and inclusion. Because what we see is that uh, with AXA globally, it's not only AXA Belgium, we've been driving this topic, not with quotas, it's an objective. Uh, uh, so there's a difference in it. Uh, it's, it's an objective part of, your, part of your bonus plan. Uh, yes, yes. So it's, a, it's not part of my bonus plan. It's part of my yearly evaluation. So how am I yeah. progressing towards it? It's not just get so many m women in your management committee and you, uh, no, no, no. Get, uh, but it's part of the, let's say, the uh, important objective, qualitative objective. And so um, uh, we feel that if you start to work on it, then you're able to identify the talents and, and indeed it doesn't have to be 50-50 to the, uh, the point sharp, but I feel, and honestly, I've said it already in this webinar, but I feel a lot more comfortable being a man in a diversity. Uh, like I come from a family of six children. There were three, uh, three boys, three girls. And so it was always a very diverse team. I see no reason why you would be suddenly around the management committee table, table with only men or only women. That is very unnatural, be it for the women or the men. And so it's a much more... Uh, let's say, humane type of uh, meetings that you have. Um, just a, a question for Christine. Um, uh, you are in the, in the IT world, uh, SAP is hardcore IT. Um, we heard this morning something about the gaming and the bias in, in, in gaming for women. Um, although that the gaming industry is, is, con is, is, is a booming business uh, for economical reasons and not only just to play games. Eh? It's the basis of artificial intelligence and, and a lot of aspects. Should we then start with a, a boost program for women in the gaming industry? Oh, that's a good question. <laughs> um, I, I think in general, I see one big topic and I would also subscribe to what Vesela said. I think also uh, we have to, to make here a mind shift for especially the women in the also very uh, equal countries. Um, and what I experienced, and I'm off since now close to a year heading a global program at SAP, which is called Women in Tech, what we see is that the girls do not have an idea what are the diverse job possibilities in IT companies, be it gaming industry, be it, uh, you know, SAP is also not seen as a very uh, fancy kind of software uh, company because our software is not so easy to understand. Uh, so, you know, the, the Googles of the world are much easier to understand. So also we are kind of like, you know, the old, uh, you know, the kind it of sounds, It sounds company. sexier. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so I think what we need to transfer is that the variety of jobs 
in the tech industry uh, is, 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 you know, requesting a lot of different um, skill sets. And we need the women in that with the different skill sets. So you have to have people who have studied computer science, but that's not the majority of the jobs in, 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 the, in the company. We need so many different uh, perspectives also. And so it's good that people also have a diverse background from a, you know, a education perspective. And I think this is the thing we have to start with. We have to make sure that we transport the, 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 the profiles or the jobs you do actually afterwards. So in, in essence, it is, you know, what you have studied or what you have great graduated in is not the most important for your career, uh, but it's, it's other things, you know, in, in software, you need to be a team player. Um, you need to have a good communication skills. Um, and this is all what people probably not expect from software industry, be it gaming, be it uh, something else. And I think this is what we have to change. Mm. And in Germany, we have still a political issue also. We have to change also, you know, we have to adopt our legal framework um, to, the, to the new normal. And I agree with you, we will not come back to uh, what we were, you know, a year back. So we have to mm. also here um, adopt this mm. change. Politically. Thank you for your view, Christine. Um, Eva, maybe uh, come back to you. Um, you mentioned in the preparation that you will train thousands young women in, in, in seven different countries. Um, Christine just mentioned we, we do not only need certifications, we also need experience. Um, so, so what are you thinking about uh, eventually evolving with the women in IT experience to, to answer to the uh, to women in IT organization to give those uh, women who have done the training more experience? Uh, well, uh, I would say that uh, uh, in our view, the solution is really in uh, bringing all the ecosystem players together. So frankly speaking, we are not uh, focusing on one single uh, good practice or one single initiative, but uh, on collaborations and on alliances. And uh, from this perspective, uh, the Women for IT project that uh, we mentioned uh, with Digital Europe and myself, um, I would say there we are planning to launch an employability award, but also this one will focus on how is the collaboration between the ecosystem players functioning? And in a similar way, I would like to mention that there is a new uh, large scale um, European uh, project, which is called ECOVAM, which just started uh, last week. And in that one also, uh, there are 21 partners from uh, eight countries that will be collaborating for four years. So it's even a, a really um, longer uh, project than previously. And there the idea is to been uh, to develop a vocational education in microelectronics center of excellence for the whole of Europe. And uh, the idea behind it is that uh, the ecosystem players should launch uh, a pact with uh, targeted actions to support more diversity in jobs. So the more uh, organizations we are working together, hopefully uh, the better for uh, all women. Thank you. Um, Thank you. So I give you a chance to, uh, to and the sound was very good, uh, by the way, Eva. Oh, the camera, thank you. So, um, uh, Sevilla, we'll maybe come back to you um, um, with an answer to my first question, but also um, uh, the, the, the session is a little bit inspired the people on initiatives they can replicate. Huh? So, so uh, what kind for easy to replicate programs uh, would you do? And, and, and maybe then referring to the previous part, uh, what, kind of, what kind of skills um, could be, or IT skills could be an advantage for women uh, by your experience? Yes, uh, Saskia, I think I can, you know, mention lots of different programs that we are taking as an initiative in Vodafone. So, you know, the empowerment programs, women in technology programs, young talent programs, we've had lots of initiatives. But I would like to mention the skills part here because 
I think it is really critical for the transformation, you know. Uh, as Vodafone, we are trying to evolve from a telco company to a techco company, so which requires a lot of new skills, by the way. When I look at our current skills, we have lots of asset skills capability, but I think when I think about our strategy, I think we need to gain some different new skills as well. So this is the most critical part. So what we are doing here is, you know, we want to bring a skill driven approach to the company. So which skills we have, which skills we should have, and what is the gap between these two? Uh, this is really very important for us. And at this point, I think the upskilling and reskilling part is coming to our, you know, mind agenda that came in, into our life. So especially in Vodafone this year, we launched 13 upskilling programs to really develop I mean, support people's development, especially in technical expertise areas. Uh, and more than, you know, 200 people attended to these upskill programs. So when I'm talking about upskilling, it means that strengthening that person in the current role. And when I'm talking about the reskilling, as you know, it is really, I mean, creating a new career, totally new career for a person. So really our target is uh, having five, more than 500 people in the upskilling programs. And when I come to the reskilling part, you know, this year we created some reskilling labs within Vodafone. Some of them are commercial, some of them are technology. So we said tech labs, especially for the reskilling part. What we are doing is really we are posting some new roles, such as DevOps, cybersecurity, etc., to the organization. And we are not looking for a lot of criteria for the application, you know, because we really want to support our people, especially help them to be ready for the future roles. So we are just getting the applications and it's really too many, by the way, because we are always explaining the, you know, the future, the requirements, etc. And people are applying for this. And then after the selection process, they, you know, uh, attended to the, uh, they attend to the academies. So the academies are including lots of different, you know, methods, methodologies, you know, to improve that capability. And while doing their current job, they're also in parallel attending to the academy. And after the academy, we are, you know, moving these people into the new roles. So this is the risk killing mm -hmm. part. And, you know, we started this with the Agile coach in Vodafone, which was really critical for our Agile transformation. Now continue with the DevOps engineering role, which is a really critical role for IT. And also we will be continuing with the uh, cyber security, which is a really very specific niche area, especially for the technology. So this is the reskilling part. And we will be, you know, completing, I think, eight or nine roles uh, by the end of this year with the reskilling part as well. So when I look at the most common IT skills, so I think uh, each can, you know, be differentiated based on the sector, business, uh, company, etc. But I would say the most uh, common IT skills are, you know, the automation and robotics, which is really critical, mm -hmm. the automation and simplification as well. The other mm -hmm. is AI machine learning. And the other one is the cybersecurity, which is a really very niche area. Uh, DevOps is really very critical from agile methodology and development and delivery perspective. It is really critical for us. And also when you come to the architecture, I can say that the microservices and the PEGA, which is one of the customer oriented design is really very critical. So currently in Vodafone, we are investing on these expertise area with the upskilling and the reskilling programs. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I can say that, to be honest, it will not be enough, you know, to have these technical expertise, but also IT people, especially the females, should also improve the soft skills as well to really become a mm -hmm. leader. Uh, so when I think about that, you know, the business acumen and also the commercial know-how is really very important because in Vodafone, we are working with tribes and there are lots of squads under the tribe structure. And in those squads, IT people and business people are working together which means that we have to, you know, I mean, come closer, understand the common language. So IT people should understand what commercial people are saying and also commercial people should understand what IT people are saying. So this business acumen and also commercial know-how is really very important in addition to this technical expertise. So these are the skills that we are currently focused on in Vodafone. And I believe that if we improve these skills, it will help our transformation to you know, I mean, uh, move from tech, telco to techco. So these are the things that I can mention. Uh, I don't know if it is a response to your question, but I think as a candidate, you know, uh, if you really build these 
skills. There are lots of different resources everywhere, online, offline, you know, because these skills are really critical all, all over the world, I believe. So I think this will help you, you know, to make a contribution uh, to a company, to, a, to an area. Uh, so I think investing on these skills will always help. Okay, and on that uh, fantastic uh, sentence, uh, I think we had to stop at uh, 12.30. Uh, Christine, uh, Vesela, Jeff, uh, Seville and uh, Eva, thank you for your uh, insights. I'm very happy that it is recorded because that it will give the people who followed it the time to listen it step by step. Um, uh, as a conclusion, um, we are not there yet, but uh, as you can hear, we have uh, a lot of good initiatives. If we can repeat them in the different counties, in the different sectors, I think we will certainly progress with the 2% which has been uh, set up uh, earlier in this call. Thank you, panel, for being there. And I give the word to uh, Gillian again. Saskia. Uh, thank, thank you, Saskia. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Saskia, for running that. And thank you to all the participants of the panel and your great ideas. That That is brilliant. So what I've taken from that and what I would believe anyway is you absolutely have to have the top management involved. You have to have them believe that this is necessary and that there are going to be huge business benefits, including Jeff, a much better working environment. And, and because I've heard this from so many people, this is something that we can help people aspire to. Um, and we also have to have, uh, both sexes involved in or even all sexes involved in supporting this and we need that because when men see that they can be part of the flexible working initiatives they can take the paternity leave they can enjoy a much more diverse culture and it feels better to be at work then then they'll all be on the on the same um, page as we are um, I also heard lots about KPIs, about young people and how they're the future of this, about inclusive cultures and how we need to nurture those in everything that we're doing. And, and I heard lots of best practice being shared. And so um, I'd, I'd like a quick vote from everybody who's left on the attendee side. If we do this again, will you come? So just tell us yes or no, because I think this is a brilliant way in which we can share more best practice. Oh, good. Oh, good. Oh, good. That's really positive. So, um, and COVID, you know, whilst it's horrendous, is actually showing us that we can share best practice so easily across the greater Europe. So this is really, really a positive aspect of that. And the last thing I, um, I took from all of this was, oh, I'm Seville and the, um, I was at, at home, I'm thinking about RPAs and I'm thinking about UiPath. And that's exactly what you were talking about. You know, the blending of the business skills with IT and how we bring all that together. So there really is a positive future here and, uh, Oh, good, good, good. So we're on to the last section. <laughs>